Hi again, it's Christina from Sunshine and Flora. So this video is part two of my cut flower Q&A. So last week I did a um, YouTube short video and also a post on the community tab asking you guys for any questions you have that are cut flower related. So this is part two. Part one was posted a couple days ago, so make sure to look for that video. I will also link it down below in the description. And I will also be linking down below in the description all of the products that I use that are cut flower related related. Okay, so let's dive right into these. So Diane says, a lot of people recommend Ami for cut flowers, but whenever I cut it, it drops lots of tiny stuff, pollen question mark on the table over time, no matter when I cut it because it keeps maturing in the vase. Not sure if you use Ami, but wondering if you knew how to deal with it and how others deal with it. Maybe hairspray question mark. Um, so I did grow Ami last year. Um, I also harvest Queen Anne's lace and yes, those do tend to drop a little bit of pollen. Um, you know, I haven't had a lot of people complain about it. I don't use an overabundance of it in my bouquets, maybe one or two stems max. I do tend to harvest it when it is fully open. So maybe some of that pollen has already dropped, um, in my garden before I harvest it. Um, but no, I don't uh, spray it with any type of thing to help prevent that in the vase. Ashley says, I am starting a cut flower business and want to sell $20 bouquets from flowers that I am growing. How do you figure out how many flowers to put in the bouquets? Should I use a markup from wholesale price of the stem or a set number of stems in each bouquet? She says 13 to 20 question mark. Um, should labor be factored in the cost? <clears throat> so first of all, I think $20 is a really good price for a bouquet, depending on your market. At my local farmer's market, I sell $15 bouquets and $5 mini bouquets. Special orders, um, I start at $20. Uh, at my big end of the season market that I do, I sell $15 jelly jar bouquets and $25 large bouquets just to set the two apart. So I would say price your bouquets based on you know, your region, what you think would sell at your local farmer's market. As far as how to figure out how many stems to put in there, that completely depends on what flowers you are putting in there. And the price per, t per stem, you want to make sure to um, look up the wholesale pricing for the stem. So I went over this a lot in part one of my Q&A, but I'll go over it again in this video in case this is the first one that you're watching. But there are a couple different ways that you can look up the wholesale pricing for your stem. The first one is to become a member of a wholesale business that like florists buy from. So there's probably one in a city close to you. Um, I am in Northwest Iowa, so there's a wholesale seller and shipper in Sioux Falls. So like I could be become a member of their um, wholesale business or register, whatever you call it, register to be able to buy from them. And then you could go on their website and you could see, for example, what they sell their sunflowers for, what they sell their snapdragons for, and then you could go off of there. The other really easy website to look at is the Boston Wholesale Market Selling. And you can Google that and you can look at that, the Boston Market Pricing. They update it every single week, what flowers are selling at that current time and what they are priced per stem. Now, the pricing, when you look that up, it will say like Snapdragon's $15. Those are bunches of 10. So a Snapdragon would be priced at $1.50. So if you're selling to a florist in your area, you you would sell her a bunch of 10 snapdragons for $15 or $1.50 each. So if you are putting that in your market bouquet, you obviously want to sell it for more than the wholesale price. So maybe you would sell that for $2 a piece or whatever you know you think it should sell for regionally. I am in a very small town, so I cannot sell my bouquets for as much for as say like Minneapolis or some big city like that. So you kind of have to use your own discretion, but if you're selling a $20 bouquet, you're not going to put 20 stems in your $20 bouquet. Um, you're going to base it on the type of flower. So maybe your $20 bouquet is made up of sunflowers that are $2 each, you know, or $2.50 each. If they're big specialty sunflowers, maybe they're $3 each. Your tulips, if they're single tulips, you know, maybe they're $1.50. If they're specialty tulips, maybe they're $2 or $3. Um, 
it just really varies with the varieties. So I would say do some research and go off of that. In your $20 bouquet, you wanna make sure that you have focal flowers, um, accent flowers, and fillers, just so it's a very interesting bouquet. Okay, so Garden Adventures says successions. What do you succession plant and at what intervals? This is a really good question. Also, do you track how many stems you cut from each plant? So, um, the second question, no, I don't really cut um, track how many stems I get from each plant. I think maybe that could be almost impossible. Um, like snapdragons, you pinch before you plant them in the ground and so they branch and so you get multiple stems per plant. Um, but then there's also like pro cut sunflowers that you only will get one bloom per stem. So if I'm planting a hundred um, pro cut sunflower seeds, I'm hoping to get, if obviously there was a hundred percent germination on those, I'm hoping to get a hundred pro cut sunflowers. Um, so succession planting, sunflowers is one of the things that I will succession plant. And I tend to plant those every two weeks. So the sunflowers that I plant, which are mostly the pro cuts, they have about a 60 day um, time from when they, when you plant them to when you can harvest them. So, you know, it's not going to be exact, exactly 60 days. So if I do a succession planting every two weeks, I almost will have a constant harvest of sunflowers. Another plant that I usually do a succession planting of are zinnias. Zinnias, while they are cut and come again, I see my plants tire out towards the end of the season. So I will typically plant one big major planting of zinnias right away in the season. And then a few weeks later, I will do another smaller planting of zinnias just to try to extend that harvest a little better, maybe have some fresher blooms towards the end of the season. Um, last year, I learned that I really should have been succession planting fever few because my first flush of fever few was noticeably stronger than my second cuttings from it. So this year I will be succession planting fever few. Um, a lot of fillers are good to succession plant. So um, anything that is one and done, um, like the sunflowers are one and done. So like cress, um, typically bupleurum is a good one to succession plant, or Leia is a good one to succession plant. Let me look at my seed starting list really quick for a second. Okay, so stock is another one I'm starting this year that is a one and done unless you're planting the quartet stock. That is a branching variety, but all other stock are um, one and done. So you wanna make sure to succession plant that if you want to taper them out through your growing season in the spring. Another filler that is a good one to succession plant is annual baby's breath. That is also one and done. One other filler that I'm trying for the first time this year that I've just made a note that I might want to succession plant is honeywort. So I will let you know how that goes as well. And um, succession planting is also a really good way to reuse your bed space. So for example, um, tulips. Tuva, tulips are a really early harvest. So that particular area, you know, once that gets harvested, maybe in another area you've, of your garden, you've already started planting out some of your main crops. So tulips will kind of overlap with that. Once you have those harvested, then say a second succession planting of something can go in where your tulips are going. So you really want to take advantage of the ground that you have and use multiple plantings in all your growing space if possible. My hoop house is a really good example of that. I will be growing all my ranunculus in my hoop house um, in one certain row. Once all that is harvested, my succession plantings will be going in that area so that that just does not remain empty for the rest of the summer. Okay, so JOCS channel says, alternative options for starting seeds. I don't have the room or the money for a big grow light setup. I totally get that. Um, if you're wanting to start seeds, the seeds themselves aren't very expensive, but that whole grow light setup can be an initial investment. Now, 
that is something that you are able to use year over year. So I think the investment is totally worth it if you are serious about getting into cut flowers. If you just want to dabble in it the first year and see if it's something that you even like doing, I would recommend buying plugs. Farmer Bailey is a really good website that you can go on and see all of the plugs that they offer. You can even choose when you want them sent to you. You know, do you want them sent March, April, May, depending on your growing zone. Um, you do have to order so many so that you can fill a box. So for example, I ordered three 125 um, plug trays because three trays will fit in one box. You don't want to just order one because you have, have um, empty box space. So if putting money into a big grow light setup isn't going to work for you this year, but you want to dabble in cut flowers, I would order plugs. There are a lot of flowers that you can also direct sow in the ground. So if you are in a, in a climate that you can direct sow seeds in the ground, I would try that first. So sunflowers can be direct sowed, zinnias, um, bachelor buttons, ami, dara, those are just a few that you can put right into your warm soil and they will come up without having to start them inside. So Amy said, how did you advertise for your CSA? Well, my CSA um, or Community Supported Agriculture, um, which I'm calling mine a bouquet subscription, I've never done one before, but this year is the first year that I will be offering it. So, and to be totally honest, sales have been a little slow. I put it out before Christmas, which I don't know if that was the right time or not. I think maybe a spring push is probably the best for me, um, but I'm just advertising it on social media with a link to my website where they can pay for it. Um, I'm putting it out on Facebook and my Instagram and hopefully will drum up sales that way. Um, she said, I thought of another question. What is one flower you could not live without in bouquets for each spring, summer, and fall? And which flower in your opinion is overrated and not worth it to grow? Thanks for advance or thanks in advance. Um, Okay, so spring, my go-to flower is tulips. Last year, I grew tulips for the first time. Um, I had flowers two months earlier than I did the year before. Everyone in the spring is so um, hungry for flowers and anything gardening related that my tulips sold like crazy. So I will never not grow tulips again. Summer, I would say, oh my gosh. I'm gonna say my transition from spring to summer was snapdragons because I feel like those are early bloomers that kind of tied me over to the main focal flowers in the summer, which would be zinnias. And going into fall, summer er, sunflowers are both summer and fall to me. So I every single bouquet that I ever make that has a sunflower in it sells. So summer and fall sunflowers. Now I will grow different kinds of sunflowers also depending on the season. So like pro cut orange, those standard ones are good summer ones. But once you get into fall, I always find that not only the pro cut orange, but like the pro cut red or the pro cut plum, those bring in those fall colors and are just something different. I feel like people see the normal sunflowers all summer, then by fall, maybe they think, oh, I don't need flowers anymore, we're getting into fall. Then you give them something different and they want them again. I also feel like dahlias were a necessity for me. Once September hits, that's like the prime bloom time for dahlias. I have to have those focal flowers going into fall. They get me all the way through October. Um, so dahlias is a must have for end of the season. Which is overrated? For me last year, it was basil. I planted an entire bed of basil thinking I was going to bank on that for all of my filler. I didn't like it. I probably am the only person that doesn't like it, but I didn't like it. So I had this whole bed of basil that I didn't like. So um, that was definitely the overrated flower for me. I also never have luck with poppies or asters. I never have luck with either of those. So um, poppies, I'm only gonna grow for the seed head to dry and I'm gonna try asters one more time this year. And if they don't work, I am never growing them again. 
Um, Lisa said, I don't have a dedicated cut flower garden. I'm trying to grow them all in just my landscape. That's totally fine. Last year was my first year doing this and I realized a lot of flowers I grew didn't look very good in my landscape. What are some flowers you could recommend to grow S cut flowers in landscape that don't look like weeds? I totally understand that. So I went over this a little bit in part one, but I would say, um, landscaping i feel like you know definitely is has to be different looking or should be different looking um, than you know a straight flower bed if you're growing cut flowers in landscape i would try to design your landscaping to look more like a cottage garden that has lots of different varieties layered looks um, very very full and lush closely planted plants because some of you know the cut flowers that you grow get so tall and need support so the closer you plant your plants together they won't just flop over and they'll be usable but they'll also look better I plant cut flowers in my landscaping there's certain celosio that I will use in my landscaping um, heliopsis echinacea is a really good one yarrow is a good one some people cut off of hydrangeas although I do not because I've heard they're very tricky you can grow tulips and daffodils in your landscaping in the spring and harvest off those peonies are very good landscaping plants you can cut off of those um did i say echinacea i think i said echin echinacea that is a really really good one daisies are a really good one to plant in your landscaping phlox are a good one for landscaping and then I would say if you want to plant a lot of annuals, you know, just kind of tuck them here and there. Like maybe have a little patch of marigolds or a little patch of zinnias, you know, or if you have a fence line, put a row of zinnias or cosmo along the back of the fence line. You do want to make sure that the varieties that you're planting, if you want to cut out of your landscaping, will be tall enough. So, um, you know, try to layer your landscaping from tall to short in the front. And then maybe the shorter varieties that edge out the front of your landscaping just aren't varieties that you you cut off of so hopefully that helps and hopefully that makes sense for you okay so Anna Lexio I totally butchered your name I think I apologize said what are your favorite fillers for each season spring early mid and late summer and which perennials perform best for you so I'll do the perennials first because I just kind of talked about perennials echinacea is a really good perennial that I cut off of there is a variety called cantaloupe and it's one of the double poofy ones and it's like um, it's the color of a cantaloupe the fruit that is a really good one I have never been able to find seeds for it but you can find um, places online where you can buy plants for it Echinacea, I find the white ones I don't have good luck with because the petals get dirty over the season, season either by dirt or bug damage. Um, but colored echinacea work really well for me. Yarrow is a perennial in my area and that works really well for me. Um, peonies are great, although when you plant a peony, you have to wait three years to cut off of it. Um, yarrow is a perennial in my area. I think, did I just say that? <laughs> that works really good for me. Rubecchia is a perennial in my area and I grow tons of Rubecchia. Those are probably my go-to perennials. I did cut off of my Spirea bushes last year and use those and that worked well. Then favorite fillers for each season. So Bupleurum was a good one for me and that one um, I succession planted. So I actually harvested Bupleurum all year long. I, what else did I use for filler last year? This is going to sound weird, but alfalfa. I used alfalfa last year and it worked really, really good. I also for filler used a type of celosia that I purchased from the garden center. That was my end of season filler. Um, I apologize, I don't know the variety, but it was all dark leaves and I got these little pink flowers which I would just cut off so that it branched off. I purchased it at a nursery. It was a bedding plant. It was supposed to get 36 to 48 inches tall. I've used that the last two years at the end of the season for my filler. It never wilt for me basically I would just keep pinching the plant all season and it grew into this huge plant and I cut back the whole plant and use it as filler the other filler I used end of season was mahogany splendor hibiscus that was a great one for me so I feel like um, early summer or early spring into summer I had greens and then in the fall I had the dark foliage and it was really pretty 
This year I am making a point to try multiple fillers, so stay tuned for how all of those work for me. All right, I am on the last page of all of my questions. Amy Lulu 9999 says, Hi, Christina. I am wondering where and how you store your cut flowers. Ooh, good question. I am looking into building a cooler slash storage unit with a cool bot. Thanks. This is a really good question. So the first year I grew cut flowers, I did not have anything to store my flowers in. Um, I just didn't think about that. And I ended up using the, um, I have one of those little short fridges here at my work that I would obviously use for food and drinks. I ended up putting a bucket of flowers in there all the time, um, which was so dorky because you can hardly fit anything in there. Um, so last year, especially because I was growing tulips, I knew I had to have some type of cold storage unless I was harvesting the tulips and like directly taking them with the bulb on to a florist, I needed somewhere to store them. So for me last year, I just got a fridge and I'll put pictures up on the screen, but it's one of the, um, double fridges. It has uh, the freezer on one side and the fridge on the other side. I got it free from my neighbor. She was trying to get rid of it and she didn't want anything for it. She just wanted it out of her garage and it works awesome. So I put hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tulips in there last year. I don't know what I would have done without that. So fridges work really well. You do, however, want to make sure you monitor the temperature. So I keep a thermometer in there at all times and I keep it anywhere from 38 to 40 degrees. Now I have seen a lot of people that will dedicate a special room as a cooler and depending on how big I get, I can see myself having to do that in the future. Where I would put that, I have no idea, but I I have seen people building um, or like using a closet and then they will put an air conditioner in there um, with a cool bot and like actually keeping that room cool, which I think is a really good idea. I have also seen people buy enclosed trailers or like a little one of those like little miniature U-Haul trailers and converting that with a cool bot. I think that that is a really good, um, you know, resource if you have the room for that. If you're just starting out and you're able to get your hands on a fridge, start that way because that lets you see how many flowers you can store in there and how much space you actually need. And then if you get big enough where you can't afford a florist cooler or one of the big walk-in coolers, I think the cool bot is a good resource because you can put your own shelving units in there and design it how you need to um, you know store the amount of flowers that you need okay so Melanie says not sure of the size of your growing space but it seems comparable to mine I keep wondering if I really have enough space to grow enough cut flowers to sell enough bouquets any insight on maximizing growing in a small space yes um, so ie planting plant spacing number of varieties to grow how many plants of each variety oh my gosh so I am an excessive planner and I have a very small space, although I'm doubling it this year where I grow my cut flowers. So my main garden space is roughly 30 by 50 in size, which is, if I do the math correctly, 1500 square feet. That is extremely small. You would probably call it a micro garden <laughs> if it had a name for it. Um, that is my main planting area. On the outside of my fence, I have developed a landscaping area, which I call my cottage garden area, that is less than half that size that I just fill with plants and then I cut from there as well. Last year I added four four by four raised beds just for extra planting space, which if you plant them nine inches apart, each bed holds, um, I think like 32 to 36 plants. So not a huge amount, but if I'm just wanting to try out a specific plant, that is a perfect place to put those. Um, my pumpkin planting space is three foot wide by 96 feet long. So I could grow all the pumpkins that I need in that space for my end of the year market. I also utilize that planting space um, for my first succession planting of sunflowers. So pumpkins and sunflowers I would plant direct sow about the same time. And obviously the pumpkins aren't going to get huge immediately. So I planted my sunflowers at the back of the bed and the pumpkins towards the middle of the bed and the sunflowers grew up tall and the pumpkins vined out. And then I harvested the sunflowers before the pumpkins got huge and drowned them out. So that was a really great way to kind of double that growing space. 
I would say if you're planting in a small space like mine, you want to have pathways, but I would say make your pathways as narrow as possible, you know, two or three feet, because that way you're gonna maximize your actual in-ground planting. I use landscape fabric and I cut holes in my landscape fabric at um, you know certain increments, either four, six, or nine inches apart. That helps me maximize my space because I can lay out the grid and know exactly how many plants I can fit in that space. And if I was just guessing, you know, it may kind of get off count and they wouldn't be planted evenly. I feel like by actually, you know, really calculating that, I fit more plants in my space. Um, so I would say, Measure your space, see how close together you can plant all your plants. Um, I did a full garden plan video last year, so um, go back and reference that. I also probably next week or so will be doing my 2023 garden plan. And either in that video or when I plant out all my plants, which I know last year when I planted all of my plants out, I said in the videos my spacing for every single plant. So if you want to see how I did mine, reference my older videos and watch my 2023 garden plan video that I have coming up very soon because I go over all of that information. So I, just off the top of my head, zinnias I plant nine inches apart, snapdragons I plant uh, six inches apart, lisianthus and ranunculus I plant four inches apart. Um, status and feverfew and adgeratum are nine inches apart. That's just kind of the spacing that I've used that works for me. Snapdragons I used to plant nine inches apart and I thought they could be closer. So last year I did six and it was so much better. So now I do six. Lysianthus, I tried six inches. I thought they could be closer. So last year I did four and I liked it better. So it's just kind of trial and error. But um, if you want to see what I do, reference my older videos because I always mention that. Okay, so Ashley said, any cut flowers that are good in partial shade. I'm using a few raised planters on my concrete pad this year and I think it's going to be partially shaded. Can I germinate any seed? Oh, she also says, can I germinate any seed with the wet paper towel method? So to answer that one first, yes. Um, the only variety that I am particularly familiar with is Bells of Ireland, which I am going to be doing this year. I'm sure that there are other varieties that you can use that way. Um, but Bells of Ireland, I will be doing this year that way. So stay tuned for a video on that. And then cut flowers that are good in partial shade. My Bupleurum grew in partial shade last year and grew awesome. Um, a Stilby is a good one for shade. Um, my Dara grew in partial shade last year and it grew really good. What else? My Lysianthus, although I think it would have grew better and gotten taller in full sun, it did okay in partial shade. Hydrangeas, if you use those for cutting, those grow well in partial shade. I have Yarrow that's in partial shade and it did good. Good. A lot of perennials they say can grow in shade so maybe just reference different perennials and see what grows in shade and see if any of those work for you but as far as annuals um, those are the ones that I have particular luck with. A stilby, did I say a stilby? I think I said that. <laughs> that is a shade plant and definitely a good one um, for cut flowers. Okay, so Lucy says pricing. Is it the wholesale price per stem times three? That sounds like a lot. Thank you. Um, so I already went over kind of the wholesale pricing and how I price bouquets. And so I won't go over that a ton again, but um, make sure to either look at the Boston market price, which gets updated weekly, or um, you can join one of the floral wholesale companies that sell to your local florists and see what their pricing is. Is. I went over that topic pretty extensively earlier in this video and in my Q&A one. But Lucy also says, if I sell flowers on the roadside, how many days before they are no longer fresh enough to sell, please? That's a really good question. So while I don't have a roadside stand, I do sell my flowers at the local farmer's market. And my schedule for that is I harvest my flowers on Monday, the market is Tuesday. I harvest them a full day ahead of time because I wanna make sure that they have plenty of time to get fully hydrated.
dehydrated before the market. There's certain types of flowers that wilt easier than others, and I would never want to sell um, wilted flowers to someone. So I tend to harvest everything the day before the market. Now, if a bouquet does not sell at the market, a lot of times I am comfortable bringing that back to the studio and putting it in my fridge, and it will be totally fine to sell the next day or even the next day, as long as it has not been out in the excessive heat or the direct sunlight. Um, so it kind of just depends on how your roadside stand is set up. Is it an actual stand that is out in the direct sun? Does it get a lot of sunlight? Is it in a shaded area? Are you putting the flowers out in the morning or are they out all day? Or is your roadside stand a little building that like has a cool bot in it or an air conditioner? I would say you don't want to leave flowers out there a long time where they get overheated, they, they're really gonna lose their vase life. I don't know that I would be comfortable, um, you know, selling those for multiple days. I would definitely put your flowers in the fridge or cooler overnight and put that back out. But you know, like me, if they're in an okay environment, I think that you could get a couple days out of them because you're still gonna get a nice long vase life. But it definitely depends on the conditions. If I were you, I would probably do some experiments and some vase life tests so that you know exactly how long those flowers are gonna last so you're comfortable with whatever you decide. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so just a couple questions left. Amy says, a list of perennials that are best for cut flowers, fillers, and greenery in your zone. So I kind of went over the flowers that I like for perennials when I talked about landscaping. Perennials are yarrow, rubecchia, echinacea is a really, really good one. Fillers and greenery, I don't have a lot of experience as far as perennials or woodies. I did cut off my spirea last year and that worked amazing. You know, there's a lot of woodies or shrubs that are good for cut flowers, such as nine bar, um, viburnum, mock orange is a really, really good one. That grows in my area. I personally don't have any, but um, I wish I did. They're absolutely beautiful. So I would say maybe look into, you know, different perennials like that and see what you can grow in your garden. Um, but I mostly have the best luck with the perennial flowers, which I kind of already went over. Um, peonies, of course, are another really good one that come back from year to year. If you plant those, you do have to wait the three years to Till you can harvest them, but they are totally worth it. Then Amy asks, cut flowers with the least and most pest and disease problems. Pest and disease problems. I think the more I talk, um, the less I am able to pronounce things. Fortunately, I do not have a lot of trouble with diseases. Powdery mildew is probably the one that I deal with the most. We have a lot of humidity in the summer. Um, the last couple summers we've been going through a drought, so uh, the moisture hasn't been as abundant to cause the powdery mildew, but I always get powdery mildew the end of the season. All my pumpkins took on powdery mildew this year, and then I had some zinnias take on powdery mildew. Some of my sunflower leaves weren't looking the best at the end of the season, but the blooms were totally fine. There's no way that you can kill off the powdery mildew. Um, I mean, I'm, maybe there's a spray to do it, but since I don't spray, if I see it like on my pumpkin leaves, I will cut those leaves off, put them in a trash bag and throw it away. Powdery mildew spreads airborne, so it spreads super easy. But if you can kind of try to slow it down, that is good. If you do cut the leaves off, don't put it in your compost, put it in the trash. Pest problems. I start seeing bug pressure problems in August and it's like those um, cucumber beetles, like the little green ones and some other things. They get my dahlias and my sunflowers and this year kind of my zinnias. So I use organza bags and that um, takes care of the dahlias so that they're okay. Dahlias, you have to wait for them to open most of the way before you harvest them. So that gives the bugs a chance to eat all the petals. So covering them is my solution for that. Sunflowers, I harvest my sunflowers when the petals are just lifting off the face. So the bugs do not have a chance to eat them yet. That also extends the vase life because the client get to see the sunflower open fully, but that's kind of how I combat combat the bug problems. Um, so yeah, zinnias and sunflowers and dahlias are probably my worst flowers um, for the bug problems. Okay, and so the very last question of this Q&A is from Jill. 
And she says, I'm starting my first cutting garden with limited sunny space for raised beds. So I'm planning on planting my cosmos along areas of a sunny fence line. Yes, that's what I do, good idea. And my zinnias in a bed on the south side of my house. Yes, also that's a good idea. I'm just wondering if it is okay to intersperse different varieties of the same flower in beds or is it best to have the same varieties in blocks? Hopes this makes sense. Okay, so I think I totally understand what you mean. If you are, say you have a long bed and you're planting different varieties um, in that same bed in your blocks, make sure they are of consistent height. So last year I kind of learned this the hard way. The whole middle section of my garden was full sun, but I have multiple rows of zinnias and then at the end of the bed I had a bunch of dahlias. The zinnias grew at a faster rate than my dahlias and the zinnias shaded the dahlias yes they still grew and I got blooms but they did not grow to their full potential and I did not get as many blooms as I normally would have because that plant shaded out the other plant so if you are plant planting um, different varieties in the same space I would make sure you plant them at the same time and they grow to be the same height because even if you do have a full sun area or like you said partial shade you don't want one plant to shade out the other now the sunny south side of your house I don't know how much room you have there zinnias that's a really good idea sunflowers would also work there in the hot sun south sides of buildings are so so hot so you definitely want the heat loving plants um, celosia would be good there sunflowers would be awesome there cosmos would do really good so if you have room to maybe mix a few other things you know in there um, they all should do just fine in that area but to answer your other question really just pay attention to the height of the plant to make sure they're all consistent and you'll probably be okay Okay, you guys, so that is going to do it for this very lengthy video. Um, this was part two. Again, if you didn't see part one, reference that. I hope that I answered all of your questions really well, and I hope this was helpful. I have so many exciting videos coming up, and answering your questions just gets me excited for all that. I'm going to be sharing all of my seeds starting with you guys this year, the hoop house build. Um, but one of the next videos that I will be sharing with you guys is my entire 2023 garden plan. I almost have that finalized and that will probably also be broken into two parts. I will probably do my main garden in a video and then the hoop house plan in a video. I'll be sharing um, what plants will be going where, um, the size of my beds, my plant spacing, all of that. So I can't wait to share that with you guys. So stay tuned for that and a lot more this winter all the way into spring. I hope you're having a good day and I hope you guys are getting excited about your 2023 garden as well. We'll see you soon.